Hello everyone, my name is Josh Stevens, and for you, uh, for those of you who do not know me, I am an internal medicine primary care provider with TriHealth. Um, my current locations are University Station, Hyde Park, and then I also do um, help in covering the Xavier Student Clinic. So I'm over there one day a week, starting this week. So. Um, and then just a little bit of a background on me. I did my residency at Christ Hospital here in town, and then I did some active time in the Air Force. And then my wife and I, we moved back to the area about two years ago. And about that time is when Dr. Coyle, uh, the hematology oncology department kind of reached out and was looking to start a multidisciplinary connective tissue disease clinic for adults. And um, he was looking for primary care physicians that were interested in being part of it. And so I thought it sounded interesting. I knew a little bit about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and um, pretty much the rest was history. So over the last about one and a half to two years, I've become very familiar with the diagnosis and treatment of EDS and a lot of the things that go along with it. And um, I would say last time I checked, I have around somewhere in the neighborhood of 140 to 150 EDS patients, um, which is about one tenth of my overall patient load. So um, yeah, so I have a lot of, a lot of experience with with that. So, so today our talk is going to be centered around the basics of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome um, and hypermobility spectrum disorders. So we'll go ahead and get started. So the objectives for today are we're going to focus on trying to define um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes, kind of describe the difference between hypermobility spectrum disorders and Ehlers-Danlos Ehler syndromes. Um, I want you guys to gain knowledge of the different types of EDS, but we're not going to really dive in too much into the weeds or the different criteria for them. Um, I want you guys to be able to identify the signs and symptoms of hypermobility spectrum disorders and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And then also provide a summary um, or at least know what goes into the criteria for hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And then we'll definitely talk about um, the reasons behind the differences in severity of patient symptoms from mild to severe. Um, and then I want you guys to come away with being an advocate for these patients and and really focusing on specializing their care and giving them more giving them more personal care and then at the end we will kind of talk about the uh, multidisciplinary uh, clinics role in the treatment of these patients as well and excuse me today I'm having a little bit of um, some sinus issues so if I clear my throat or <laughs> Pause, that's, that's because of that. So, just disclosure for today's talk. So, no one in a position to control content has any relationships with commercial interests. And so, we'll get started. So, what are heritable disorders of connective tissues? So, they are mutations in genes that affect how tissues within the body affect the joints, skin, bones, blood vessels, heart, lungs, ears, and eyes. Um, there are about 200 known heritable connective tissue disorders. Most are rare, but not all are, and the most common are our topic today, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and that's going to you know, primarily be patients with hypermobility, skin, hyperextensibility, mitral valve prolapse, um, to name a few of the, the physical exam signs, 
Um, Marfan syndrome, so they're going to kind of have the blue sclera, the pectus, excavatum, arachnodactyl, hind foot valgus, some aortic disease, scoliosis. Another one is osteogenesis imperfecta. So they're going to have short stature, you know, the brittle bones, blue sclera, scoliosis as well. And then another big one, or a little bit more common one, is Stickler syndrome. So they're going to have um, very uh, specific kind of orofacial and ophthalmic um, abnormalities, and then deafness and arthritis. As you can tell, there is a lot of overlap, not only between all the connective tissue disorders, like as you can see, um, Marfan and osteogenesis imperfecta have blue sclera and scoliosis a lot, EDS um, can have these as well. Uh, and then, for example, in EDS, um, you have stretchy skin. Marfan syndrome can also have that, and then that Marfanoid appearance that you see in Marfan syndrome can also be um, a part of EDS as well. So. A lot of overlap, so it kind of sometimes makes it a little difficult to discern what connective tissue disorder might be going on, but there are some, there are some hallmarks to each kind of connective tissue that kind of helps key you in the more experience you have with seeing them. <clears throat> so we'll move on to what are the hypermobility spectrum disorders. So... And this will kind of, it will shift once we start talking about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and we'll kind of see where the differences are. So, hypermobility spectrum disorders. And typically, they're symptomatic joint hypermobility, but they can also be asymptomatic. But the, this hypermobility does not meet specific criteria for other disorders with hypermobility, like hypermobile EDS. And typically, um, this can range um, with joint hypermobility with no other symptoms to complex um, joint hypermobility with life-altering symptoms similar to hypermobile EDS. It can be localized or affect all joints, and the treatment is the same as what we would do for hypermobile EDS. Typically, uh, in my experience, when I have ruled out either hypermobile EDS or other connective tissue disorders, that's when, and excluded all other uh, disorders, then that's when I go ahead and say they have, you know, localized hypermobility of the knees, knees or the overall generalized hypermobility of all their joints. And like I said, it's really important to make this statement to your patients um, because a lot of the time, our patients, when they come in to see me for an evaluation for EDS or hypermobile EDS, if I don't make that specific diagnosis or they don't meet that specific criteria, criteria for hypermobile EDS, then they think that you know they don't they don't have anything to explain all their symptoms, and we want them to know that it can hypermobility, whether localized or generalized, can still cause all the symptoms that they're experiencing, and it requires from you, the provider, medical attention and validation for that patient. And as you'll see we will treat it exactly the same as hypermobile EDS. <clears throat> All right, so not the best slide, as you can see, whoever made this slide, which was not me, did not get rid of the, um, the red lines, but this was the best one I could find to kind of summarize everything. So as you can see, when we take into account the Bighton score and musculoskeletal involvement, and we'll talk about the Bighton score here in a minute when we go over the criteria for hypermobile EDS, but um, when we take those into account, 
it kind of gives us an idea of whether um, the patient is asymptomatic and or where their hypermobility is located. So asymptomatic versus symptomatic and whether generalized hypermobility, peripheral hypermobility, or localized hypermobility. So musculoskeletal involvement basically means do they have pain? Do they have soft tissue or musculoskeletal tissue trauma? Do they have degenerative joint or bone disease, flat feet, scoliosis? Do they have a lordosis in their lower, lower spine, a kyphosis in their upper spine, things like that. That's what you're looking for when it says absent or present. And then, um, as most of you probably already know, you know, joint hypermobility basically is a term to describe the capability of the joints to move past their kind of normal range of motion. Um, I'm trying to think here. I think that's about it for that slide. So as you can see, there's a wide range, and the next slide's gonna give us a little bit more kind of insight into that. So whenever I see a new patient that is wanting to be evaluated or referred to me for evaluation for EDS or hypermobile EDS, I always like to set up the visit from the standpoint of what I was talking about earlier. They, they're coming to know if they specifically have EDS, but I don't want them, like I said, to get their hopes up or to cling all of their hopes to whether or not it's EDS or not. Because as you can see, hypermobility is a spectrum. And so I always tell them I like to think of um, hypermobility and EDS, kind of like the color spectrum. Um, and so I set it up, you have hypermobile EDS over here, and you let's say you have localized hypermobility of your hands or your knees over here. It's not like this is severe and this is mild. I tell them, you know, of my 140 EDS patients, which is probably a little bit more than that because I have some that are other types of EDS, and I have some hypermobility spectrum disorders. I have some patients, obviously, that meet criteria for EDS, but their symptoms are mild, or they're asymptomatic. They really don't have any symptoms other than their bite and score is positive. So, but then I have patients that have generalized hypermobility throughout their body, they don't formally meet that criteria for EDS, but their symptoms are severe and that hypermobility, that defect in the connective tissue has affected other organs and tissues in their bodies. It's caused them to have a constellation of symptoms that makes it hard for them to go about their daily lives. So that's what I set up with the patient. I'm like, I do not want you to cling to whether or not I formally diagnose you with EDS because if you're hypermobile, it can still explain everything that you're suffering with. Um, prior to me doing the evaluation, my medical assistant has a questionnaire that she gives to the patient and it's just a bunch of symptoms or medical history that I have them answer. And I tell them, I'm like, you see all this stuff on here, if you're hypermobile, it can still explain that. So, all right, switching gears here. So this is gonna start showing you kind of the differences maybe between hypermobile spectrum disorders and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, it's a group of inherited connective tissue disorders and it affects men and women of every race and ethnicity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, why certain races, and ethnicities tend to be more hypermobile, why women tend to, it seems, grow into their symptoms and why men tend to grow out of their symptoms even though genetically they are equally distributed with these mutations. So um, Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are currently classified into 13 subtypes and there are six more common types 
And then the most common type is hypermobile type or type three. Um, and each subtype has a different set of clinical criteria to make the diagnosis. And it usually includes, you know, physical exam signs, symptoms to match up to major and minor criteria. Hypermobile EDS criteria is a little bit different in the fact that there's not really major and minor, um, but we'll go over that here in a little bit. And like I kind of said, and we'll talk a little bit more about here on the next slide, but these different types of EDS are varied in their effects and causes. And kind of a commonality between all 13 types, and not all of them have this, but you'll see a lot of hypermobility, skin hyperextensibility, and tissue fragility. And like I said, kind of with connective tissues, uh, disorders in general, there's a lot of overlap in these types. Um, let's see here. Let me see if I had any other points on that. And then uh, as we move on to the next slide, as you can see, you have all the different EDS types on on there with kind of whether they're autosomal dominant versus autosomal recessive. So obviously, you know, autosomal dominant, if your patient's diagnosed with it, their offspring have a 50% chance of um, being diagnosed with it because they only need one parent, whereas autosomal recessive, they need both parents and there's a 25% chance there. The other kind of thing to think about here is it's thought that EDS, especially hypermobile EDS, has a variable penetrance so, and a variable expressivity. So that kind of plays into why do some patients have mild symptoms and why do some have severe symptoms. You'll see in a family, and I see it a lot, that I'll have a mother who has only recently been diagnosed with EDS. She's in her 40s, right? And her symptoms are mild, or she really doesn't have much. She really didn't have any issues throughout life, and that's why she only recently got diagnosed, because she's bringing her daughter in who has more severe symptoms. And so you can see, um, you know, a mother having mild symptoms, a daughter kind of having severe symptoms and kind of that phenotypic variance that, you know, variable penetrance of the ge genetic mutation. <clears throat> it's also important to know that even though these may be going down through a line, a family line, that a, a son or a daughter can have a de novo kind of genetic mutation where they're the first member in the family to have the diagnosis of EDS, whether it's hypermobile or another type. Typically though, let's say for example, vascular EDS runs in the family, it's very unlikely um, for, um, so let's say the mother has vascular, it's very unlikely for the daughter to then come up with myopathic um, EDS. So, the vascular or the type of EDS pretty, it runs pretty true throughout the family. Unless there's no history, then that can be a de novo. Or let's say it goes from hypermobility spectrum disorder to hypermobile EDS. That's another thing that you can see. So like I said earlier, I was going to talk a little bit more about ethnicity and things that affect um, hypermobility. So. With ethnicity, Asian Americans and African Black um, populations tend to be more hypermobile. Um, so those tend to potentially have maybe more symptoms or affect it more severely. The other kind of thing that falls into this is kind of biological sex for a lot of different reasons. If you think about it, men are just inherently designed to have more tone in their muscles. And so how do we compensate for hypermobility? Tone in your muscles to keep everything kind of tight and together, right? So that helps them. 
And then women, if you think about it, are inherently designed to have less tone. So that is unfortunately does not help them. And then you start to think about kind of the sex hormones, um, the biological hormones. So um, first, men are inherently designed, I already, thought, I already talked about that. So for men, when they are going through puberty, they, um, you know, testosterone kicks in. And testosterone actually obviously increases the tone in muscles. So then that allows men to kind of to bring their joints closer together and have less hypermobility and less strain on their joints. With women, if you think about it with puberty and menstrual cycles and pregnancy and menopause, there's a lot of changes going on there primarily in the balance of progesterone and estrogen. And if we think about it, progesterone actually um, loosens collagen or connective tissue, whereas estrogen stabilizes that connective tissue. So in puberty, when all those things are starting to kick off, sometimes women are gonna start experiencing symptoms from their EDS or their hypermobility. And then pregnancy, they're going to notice those changes in hormones. And then also there's another hormone called relaxin that's going to loosen that connective tissue. So symptoms sometimes can get worse as well. And then if you think about it for menstrual cycles, prior to the menstrual cycle, about five days prior to it, progesterone surges. So a lot of women will see an increase in their symptoms. And then after their menstrual cycle, progesterone is higher than estrogen, so increase in their symptoms. And then lastly, if you think about it with menopause, what happens to estrogen? It goes away, and that stabilizes the connective tissue. So you sometimes can see a worsening of symptoms there. Because the important thing is to know is that hypermobility and EDS are not progressive. They may evolve for differing reasons, but they are not progressive. And typically the reasons why they progress is either no diagnosis of hypermobility, misdiagnosis, or mis kind of management of the hypermobility. Because if we're not focusing on developing tone in a low impact way, then they're gonna, these patients, are going to overstretch their joints, cause damage, pain. They're gonna develop early arthritis and osteoporosis, and they're gonna have a lot of symptoms, as opposed to if this patient is diagnosed at an early age and we can get them into EDS physical therapy, we can really affect change. Other things that can really affect it is your age or aging. And we'll talk a little bit here in a, in a minute about kind of the evolution of hypermobility and EDS and kind of different stages with regards to age. Also, there's this idea of kind of the types of hypermobility, whether it's bony, whether it's collagen related, whether it's neuropathic and typically have an overlap of those. But that's gonna cause differing symptoms as well, in varying combinations. We talked about muscle tone and so whether or not, you know, the person, uh, physical attribute, they are, um, have a lot of muscle tone or they participate in sports, etc. Psych psychological characteristics, dietary ha habits, if they've had significant trauma or surgery, periods of immobility, and then kind of that feedback um, in their joints of where they are in space. So now I'm going to transition to just doing a brief overview of the 12 of the other, uh, 12 of the 13 types of EDS. I'm not going to dive into the weeds. There are specific criteria that make these diagnoses, and even I don't know them by heart because I only have a few of each of these, um, but we're really going to um, kind of do a brief overview of these and then we'll really dive into the weeds with hypermobile. So first and foremost is classical Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So 
if you go back to this slide, you can kind of see what the genetic mutation is. It shows you right there, it's a type 5 collagen. So it affects collagen. And what you're going to see with these patients is pain, hyperextensible and fragile skin, easy bruising and scarring. Um, it doesn't repair well, the skin doesn't. And, and the scarring can be kind of uh, really disfiguring. And I'll, I'll come to the next slide and kind of it will be a side-by-side -side comparison here of like, what does the scarring look like for hypermobile versus classical? <clears throat> Excuse me. And so as you can see, there's definitely, from a visual perspective, a difference there. And the difference that you're seeing is with hypermobile, it's going to be more atrophic scarring. That scar is going to um, kind of not, the wound itself not going to heal well. It's not going to fully come together. The scar is going to stretch out over time, either lengthwise or widthwise, and it's going to look like that on the left. With classical, you're going to see, you can have the atrophic, but you're going to see kind of more like the paper, papery, uh, thin scars, um, kind of like you can see there. And also you can see um, hemosideric deposits, black and brown deposits in those scars as well. And you're going to see that more in the classical. And then the other thing kind of to discern between skin hyperextensibility that is in hypermobile EDS versus like classical is how much that skin extends. So as you can see there, that's really ex extensible skin, but you're not going to see that amount in hypermobile. And kind of the cutoff point is two centimeters of hyperextensibility. So in your hypermobile patients, it's going to be very little. And as you can see, I have a little bit of that. I have some hypermobility in my hands, but um, so just something to look out for. <clears throat> the next kind of, I would say more common um, would be vascular EDS. So this is like of all the EDS types, the one with reduced lifespan, because as you can see, it can cause Arterial, arterial aneurysms, ruptures, dissections, bowel and uterine ruptures. And these things are gonna typically happen early in life, at least by teenage years. So these patients, at least for us who deal in adult medicine, I see patients 16 above, they're most likely going to have this diagnosis prior to coming to see me. <coughs> Excuse me. So they've gone to like children's and saw a geneticist or their mother or father had vascular and they've been genetically kind of screened to see if they have that. So the average lifespan for these patients is 49 for men and 53 for women, but it's a range of 10, age 10 up to age 80. And arterial rupture is the most common cause of death. Um, even minor trauma can cause extensive bruising and skin tears, and they typically have pretty strikingly translucent skin. They can have premature aging of their feet and hands, varicose veins. They have distinguishing um, facial features, and including prominent eyes. <clears throat> so the next one is classical-like EDS. So. So with these patients, they're going to have very similar signs to classical. And I'll explain the difference here in a minute. But, you know, the hyperextensible skin over two centimeters, easy bruising, poor wound healing, generalized hypermobility, um, that soft velvety skin. The difference between classical-like and classical is they are not going to have that scarring. They're not going to have the paper thin or even the atrophic scarring. So that's the big difference there. Next is cardiac valvular EDS. So once again, as I said, there's a lot of overlap here, right? So still, this is one that's going to most likely have some joint hypermobility, some skin involvement, but then they're going to have that severe heart valve disease. And they're most likely going to have heart valve replacement at some time in the early uh, adult years. So once again, they may have already come to you with this diagnosis if you're seeing them for the first time or they have this severe heart disease 
heart valve disease and they're being sent to you for evaluation for possibly having cardiac valvular. Next is arthrochalasia. So they're going to have severe generalized joint hypermobility and then at birth they're going to have bilateral hip dislocations. And then they're going to like, once again, have that hyperextensibility of the skin. They're going to have a lot of subluxations, dislocations of both the small and large joints. Actually recently had a patient that came in to be evaluated by me and she had had bilateral hip dislocations at birth. So I'm sending her for genetic uh, testing um, for po possibly having arthrochalasia. EDS. So next one, dermatosporaxis EDS. So they're going to have extreme skin fragility and severe um, bruising. So it's going to, they're going to have almost like redundant, uh, lax skin. So almost like if somebody went through severe weight loss and they have all that extra skin, all those extra folds, etc. That is somebody that if they're also kind of having other symptoms to consider for this. And like I said, very severe susceptibility to bruising. Another one is kyphoscolytic EDS. So these patients are gonna be born with less muscle tone. They're gonna most likely be born with kyphosis of their upper um, spine. And then they're gonna have that generalized joint hypermobility too. There's two kind of genetic mutations or forms. Um, the first one, um, I'm just going to say PLOD or PLOD1 mutation. They're going to have the abnormal spine curvature at birth. They're going to have the reduced muscle tone and a joint hypermobility. And then the other mutation, FKBP14, they're going to have kyphoscoliosis, um, severe reduced muscle tone and atrophy at birth the joint hypermobility, they might have congenital hearing loss, and then they have a lot of chronic pain and disability. So the genetic testing in this is gonna help you really discern kind of which one uh, more primarily. You might have an idea based upon those symptoms. Um, next one's brittle cornea syndrome. So these patients are gonna have thin corneas. Here's kind of that overlap with Marfan. They're gonna have blue sclera, joint hypermobility, mild skin involvement. So they're going to have risk of spontaneous corneal rupture and too often blindness or severe vision loss. Next one, spondylodysplastic EDS. So here you go. Once again, there's some overlap here, right, with osteogenesis imperfecta. Short stature, bowing of limbs that reduce muscle tone. So this is kind of overlapping um, with one of the previous EDS, and then they will have delayed motor and cognitive development. So with this one, there's kind of three different genetic mutations. There's a lot that go into the different physical features, exam signs, I'm not gonna go into, into those weeds. The so next one is musculocontractural EDS. So they're gonna have characteristic facial features, multiple contractures of um, the large joints um, at birth, characteristic skin findings, so um, fine palmar creases. They're gonna have peculiar finger shapes. I couldn't find a good picture of this, but if you Google this EDS and look at images, they're, they're quite interesting. They're gonna have progressive spinal and foot deformities and then also eye and urinary tract issues. Next one, myopathic EDS. So they're gonna have muscle weakness from childhood or even infancy, joint hypermobility, primarily in the small joints or more peripherally, and then contractures in the large joints. Um, it tends to get, their muscle weakness tends to get better with age, and then some deterioration in like the fourth decade. And then I, I believe before we talk about hypermobile, this is the last um, type other than hypermobile. So this is periodontal EDS. So these patients are gonna have severe periodontitis. 
So, and it's going to be rather extensive in their mouth. I recently had a patient, actually a medical student, um, that had periodontitis and some hypermobility, but he was more along the lines of the hypermobility spectrum disorder. His biting score was not more than five, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And he primarily only had it in his front bottom teeth. So, but, you know, as a part of that kind of phenotypic variance, I went ahead and recommended getting him genetically tested. And I currently don't know the kind of outcome of the, that test yet, so. <clears throat> um, before I transition into hypermobile EDS, the other thing I think I forgot to mention is all the different types of EDS, with the exception of hypermobile EDS, have an actual genetic mutation that has been discovered. So if we would go back all the way to that slide, you can see the actual genetic mutation or gene that's involved in the type of connective tissue. For hypermobile, we don't know the gene and we don't know the connective tissue that's involved. But from genetic analysis, we do know that it is autosomal dominant. So, moving forward. So, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So, it is believed to be the most common connective tissue disorder out there. And it, kind of like everything else, you know, you're going to have that joint hypermobility with subluxations and dislocations, skin issues, and then some other issues to include chronic pain and fatigue, dysautonomia, GI issues, TMJ, dental issues, spine problems, mast cell disorders. Because <clears throat> if you think about it, connective tissue is everywhere. It's in every organ, every tissue. So if it's defective, not only in hypermobile, but in other connective tissue disorders, it can cause a wide range of symptoms and problems. So like I said earlier, Hypermobile EDS does not progress over time. Typically, the reason it might seem to have progressed is because of what I had mentioned earlier. No diagnosis, misdiagnosis, or mismanagement, or changes in hormones that we discussed earlier. So, but hypermobile EDS does tend to evolve over time. So, the first years of life, those patients are going to be in the hypermobility phase. They're gonna be contorting their joints, they're gonna have sprains and dislocations, typically related to their lower limbs or with fine motor or repetitive task, um, easy fatigability, but they tend to not have too much pain yet or disability going on yet. And then in the second to fourth decade is really the pain phase. And this is kind of where I see a lot of patients come to me is because, you know, maybe they were a, a, you know, an athlete and they, whatever sport it was, even though maybe it was a high impact sport, that sport still developed tone and helped keep their joints together. But it wasn't until they had the cumulative effect of that high impact that they start to experience pain. And so that's why early diagnosis in the adolescent teenage years is really important. So then we can train those patients, teach those patients how to protect their joints so they don't have pain later in life. But typically the second to fourth decade is when patients start to have that widespread or worsening musculoskeletal pain. They have pelvic pain in women and headache. They have worsening fatigue along with a lot of other complaints. <clears throat> Trying to find my mouse here, I'm not sure where it went. And then observed in some adults and the elderly is kind of the stiffness phase, stiffness phase. So basically, you know, this starts for women after menopause when, you know, those, those hormones change. And so they start to get kind of more, not contractures, but tightness of their muscles. And this can be really cause a lot of um, immobility, decreased functionality, and disabling symptoms of pain and fatigue. So, 
Now we're going to shift into and really dive into what is the diagnostic criteria for EDS because this is what you are going to see most commonly. Because, for example, I have, I approximate, I know I have about 140 hypermobile EDS patients, but then I know I have probably like four or five hypermobility spectrum disorder patients. And then I think I have two classical EDS patients, and then one or two kyphoscolytic, and then the one I talked about with regards to the arthrochalasia, and then potentially periodontal. So 140 versus 15 to 20. So you're going to see hypermobile EDS and hypermobility, hypermobility spectrum disorders a lot more than these other less common forms of EDS. So I really want you to know what to look for. Doesn't mean you have to diagnose it, but you know when to refer to me or Dr. Coyle. So first and foremost is gonna be the, the Biden score. And the diagnostic criteria is made up of three criteria, and this is the first criteria. And as you can see, there are kind of five things that you look at, and you get a point for each one. So if you're able to bend your finger, your pinky finger, or your fifth digit backwards um, beyond 90 or dorsiflex beyond um, 90 degrees, then and you get a point for each hand. So, and then the next one is um, bending your opposition of your thumb or apposition, I should say, to the flex, flexor aspects of your forearm. So you get one point for each of those. Hyperextension of your elbows, so like this, um, past the 10 degrees. Hyperextension of your knees past 10 degrees. And then being able basically to put your hands flat on the floor, bending forward without bending your knees. And for me, the way I go about this, obviously, you know, op the apposition to the flexor forearm, that whether or not they can touch, that's easy. Whether or not they can put your hands flat on the floor. Um, Bending the finger, dorsiflexing it, typically, usually, easily, visually seen, but I also use a goniometer to measure the angle. And then the same thing for the elbows and knees, I use a goniometer to measure that as well. <clears throat> um, and then it depends on their age and sex, what score they need to have. So there's a possibility of nine points. So for basically children and adolescents, they need to be six or greater on that score. So six out of nine. For men and women um, to age 50, they need to have five out of nine. And then men and women over the age of 50, they need to have four. Because kind of think about it, like in those phases of hypermobility, you know, you're more hypermobile when you're younger, and then you tend to get stiffer kind of like we talked about as you get older. So they're, they're going to be less hypermobile, especially once they get over the age of 50. <clears throat> so this might be a little hard to see, but this is cri criteria two, and there's three parts or features to this. And this is feature A. And these are kind of the physical exam signs. And you have to have five out of these 12 to meet this criteria. And for um, criteria two, out of the three features, you have to meet two of them in order to meet the second criteria. So the unusually soft, velvety skin, the mild skin hyperextensibility. So I think that these first two are rather subjective. The soft, velvety skin, um, and hyperextensibility. Now we have a little bit of a cutoff, like I talked about with classical, where if you're having like kind of mild like this, like I have here, and I'll show, I believe I show, I showed the picture earlier of classical, um, but if it's less than two centimeters, it doesn't stick closely to the skin, that's pretty much mild hyperextensibility. The more you do it, the more you'll get an idea for it, experience with it. But the one I really have a hard time with is like the soft velvety skin that I feel like is very subjective. Not my most favorite criteria. 
So, but I do evaluate for it. The other one, which I'll show you in the next page, kind of some examples are, are unexplained stretch marks and red streaks on back, groin, thighs, breast, abdomen without significant weight loss or weight gain. Um, and then there are these physiogenic papules of the heel. And I'll show you an example of that. But the most important thing that I learned quickly in doing these evaluations is, which makes sense because basically <clears throat> this is a herniation of the connective or through the connective tissue and through the skin of, of tissue, right? So it makes sense that the best way to see it is when they're actually standing and placing weight on their heels. A lot of times you're not going to be able to see this if they're not weight bearing. So definitely make sure that you're having them weight bear. And the other um, one is recurrent or multiple abdominal hernia. So this can be inguinal, hiatal, umbilical. A lot of EDS patients will have the umbilical, but it needs to be recurrent or multiple. So then kind of what we talked about, atrophic scarring. I showed you that picture, the difference between hypermobile EDS scarring, which is atrophic, and classical, which is that kind of paper thin, hemosideric deposits. And then if they have pelvic floor, rectal, or uterine plug prolapse, and typically, you, you know, these are going to be in men and then women that haven't had vaginal births, right? Um, this is kind of another little bit of a subjective one for me too. I always ask the question, have you ever been told you have dental crowding and a higher narrow palate? And if they say yes or no, I ask, Do you, have you ever had braces? Have you ever had to have teeth removed to make room for other teeth? Have you ever had to have a palate expanders? And that kind of gives me a good idea. But then at the same time, if they answer no to all those, I'm looking in their mouth and I'm subjectively <laughs> deciding if I feel like their teeth are crowded. So some people, it's very easy to tell, or if they have a high and narrow palate. Once again, you get more comfortable with this with experience. And then, Next thing is kind of the arachnodactyl. And I'm gonna show you um, a picture of this and kind of how to kind of measure this. Um, next thing is I do their arm span or their wingspan. And the ratio of their arm span, the height needs to be greater than 1.05. I have a lot of patients that are in like the 1.02, 1.03. Very few do I have that are in 1.05 or above. And this is another place that it's going to overlap with Marfan syndrome. And then I always ask, have you ever had an ultrasound or an echo of your heart? And if they haven't, then that's something to consider testing for the future, depending on what I hear on physical exam and where they're at with the criteria, because they can have mitral valve prolapse is another criteria and then aortic root dilation. So that was a lot. Um, thanks for bearing with me on that. But like I said, they have to have five out of those 12. So on the left here, you can see um, kind of those stretch marks and kind of almost red streaks on the abdomen. And then on the right, you can see these kind of herniations in the heels, and those are the pisogenic papules. You can typically see them when you kneel down and look at the heels, but I also like the feel for them as well, because sometimes, especially the ones kind of more anterior on this picture of the heel, those could be skin changes. Those don't necessarily have to be papules. So, so here's kind of that Steinberg sign and the Walker Murdoch sign. So the Steinberg sign is basically, you're gonna have them tuck their thumb and then wrap their fingers. And really you want to see, mine does a little bit, but you want to see the thumb really stick out like it's showing there. And then, and you want to see it on both sides. And then the other one's the Walker Murdoch sign. So <clears throat> you want to make sure that you have them take their thumb and their fifth digit or their pinky and see if they can touch it together. I can't, but as you can see in that picture, um, they're touching. I have a lot of patients that can overlap it. And it's ridiculous how much they can overlap it too. So kind of feature B or part B of criteria two 
is a positive family history. So they have to have a first degree relative that, ha relative that has been independently diagnosed with hypermobile, hypermobile EDS. Has to be first degree relative and it has to be independent of the patient. And then feature three, and you only have to have um, one of these. And so if they, and I just kind of asked these questions. And some of these, the last um, bullet point is a question on that questionnaire that I have them fill out. But musculoskeletal pain in two or more limbs recurring daily for at least three months or chronic widespread pain for greater than three months, or recurrent joint dislocations or frank joint instability in the absence of trauma. Now, I have a lot of patients that say, well, I don't feel like I'm dislocated, but they'll feel like their joints have been unstable or kind of been subluxing, moving, but not completely out of the joint. Like I said, they only have to have one of these. And then overall, for all the criteria two, they only have to have two of the three. And then criteria three, once again, small type. But basically, when I'm going through the evaluation of EDS, you have in the back of your head whether or not they can meet criteria for another form of EDS, another connective tissue disorder, or another kind of her heritable um, diagnosis like uh, an inflammatory autoimmune disorder like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or things like that. So I'm thinking, you know, okay, their skin's stretchy. Could it be classical? Um, they have an arm span to um, height ratio of greater than 1.05, and they also kind of have that caved-in chest. Could it be Marfan's? They have short stature. Could it be osteogenesis imperfecta? or the other form of EDS that has that as well? Or, you know, do they have specific physical exam findings like a malar rash or, um, you know, ulnar deviation of their MCP joints that would maybe may tell me lupus or rheumatoid arthritis? I'm going through that. And then also I, I'm looking through everything that they've had done, which Epic tends to make this a little easier that I can see everything through all, all the systems in Cincinnati or the local area to see what type of testing they've had. Have they had all the serological testing for autoimmune inflammatory disorders? Have they seen a rheumatologist? On and on. Now, when it starts to get a little bit hard is when I have patients coming from outside of Cincinnati. So, for example, I have somebody that lives all the way up in northwest Michigan up by the Upper Peninsula. It's kind of harder to get access to um, her results and whatnot. So basically all that to say is you want to rule out all other causes for um, their hypermobility and symptoms. And they have to meet, you know, that you've ruled out all these specific things before you can formally diagnose them with hypermobile EDS. So I hope that makes sense. So let's say we made a diagnosis of hypermobile EDS or we've made a diagnosis of hypermobility spectrum disorders. Well, now what? Where do we go from here? So I always like, I always, I'm gonna just run you through what I tell my patients <clears throat> to make it simple because this can be rather complex and very overwhelming for them and very overwhelming for us as a physician. But it, it falls into three things initially. Like I talked about before, how do we compensate for those hypermobile joints, right? Well, that's developing tone in our muscles to keep everything together. But we need to do that in a low impact way. And that looks like, you know, recumbent bike, water exercise, swimming, things like that. And it's very important, the foundation for their treatment to protect their joints, decrease pain and symptoms, decrease the risk for early arthritis and osteoporosis is to see a physical therapist who is familiar with EDS. Because that physical therapist is gonna be able to do a general evaluation head to toe to kind of give the patient education on how to protect their joints, what a low impact exercise program looks like. But then also that physical therapist is gonna help them work with or work through specific joint issues. 
and then get that patient to a specific orthopedic physical therapist. Or maybe they have headaches and they need to see a headache therapist, or they need speech therapy or OT. That's going to be an important foundation for the rest of this patient's life. And I'll talk about this, but we have that through TriHealth. Second, I tell them is education, education, education. I give them a list of resources, and if any of you guys are interested in it, just reach out to me. But I tell them they need to educate themselves because then that gives them the information of knowing if they have a symptom and possibly if it is related to EDS, and if so, then they know to come and talk to me. And then we can make an informed decision together about what's the next steps in diagnosis and management. And to go hand in hand with that is thinking, I tell them to think about their symptoms in the context of their daily life and what, and then prioritize their symptoms. So what's the most dis, disabling symptom that they have? And that's what we're going to start with, number one. And then we're going to start working through that because that helps them stay organized with, because a lot of times they come in with a flood of symptoms. They get overwhelmed, I get overwhelmed, and where are we now? Um, but if we are prioritizing, okay, my chronic generalized joint pain, I barely can function. Okay, let's work on that. And then the next thing and the next thing. And if they're educated, then they know more about what that might look like, what that management looks like, what that diagnosis looks like, et cetera. And, and kind of going back to that, that's kind of where this specialized care comes in. It's not going to be this, I mean, yeah, there's this kind of broad general initial management I've given you, but it's not going to be the same thing for every patient. It's going to have to be specialized and personalized for that patient. So you just can't throw a, um, a management kind of list down at the patient. You know, you're going to have to, all their symptoms, because since it varies in how it um, expresses, and, and their symptoms and in their body, it's going to need differing things and different ways of managing. So I hope that makes sense. So on that note, um, just a little bit of an overview of the TriHealth Multidisciplinary uh, Connective Tissue Disease Clinic that we have established at TriHealth. Dr. Coyle, of hematology oncology was the brainchild of this about two years ago and COVID slowed us down a little bit but to the point to where we finally have been able to do what I'm doing today probably would have been able to do this sooner but you know how that goes so um, I just wanted to show you that kind of that we have an order set for our specialists so just like I said you know, there's Dr. Coyle and there's me who are very comfortable with the diagnosis and management of hypermobile EDS and other forms of EDS. And personally, me, I won't speak for Dr. Coyle, some other forms of connective tissue disorders. But when you have a patient that maybe you are the PCP and maybe I just made the diagnosis, but now they're having new symptoms, maybe their GI symptoms, you want to know who to refer to. Who's more familiar with EDS in the GI field? And that's where this comes into play. So you're going to go under smart sets under your plan, and you're going to type in what I've boxed here in yellow, the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome Referral Order Set. And when you do that and open the smart set, this is going to pop up to your right. And then some of this needs to be updated, and some additions are coming this way but you're gonna see the different, the different people. So for example, cardiology doesn't have the name on the list, but when you print the referral, it will. Dr. Winner is kind of our cardiologist that helps us out in that area. And that's gonna be for like things like POTS and whatnot. Dr. Fitch is kind of, and Dr. Cranley are the ones that are a little bit more familiar with EDS and help us out a lot with like kind of the GI issues that I'm um, like uh, irritable bowel syndrome or eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, another, we have a whole range of orthopedic surgeons and you know delineated out from hand to hip to knee, etc. 
So, and there are some other ones over the last two years that I've come more familiar with, um, like vascular, we should probably add, neurosurgery, et cetera. Um, and then past this, uh, Dr. Corey and I have become pretty familiar with um, everyone in the tri-state area, Midwest, kind of East Coast that deal with these things. And we have a whole nother list um, kind of for physicians outside of tri-health. But obviously, we want to try to keep as much as possible in tri-health because it makes it easier on the patient because they have tons of visits. And it just makes it easier for us to review the documentation and develop this plan. So, all right. And then last but not least, um, last but not least is we do now have an EDS nurse navigator. And this EDS nurse navigator, her name's Amy Williams. Now, we kind of had her first, Amy can correct me, but I want to say it was like around December. But then she kind of got swallowed up by the convalescent plasma program with regards to COVID. But now that that's kind of slowing down, we're able, better able to utilize her now. So this is kind of her contact info. So you are always more than welcome to reach out to Dr. Coyle or I through Epic staff messaging, email, Bolt. But also if you have any questions about coordinating care for our EDS patients, this is the person to reach out to. Amy kind of knows who we refer to, who to get, a, get people to etc. She can reach out to us, so definitely utilize her contact info. And last but not least is kind of the EDS physical therapy. So we've established with pros physical therapy through TriHealth kind of two locations where we do this physical therapy. And these, and these physical therapists are a lot more familiar with EDS patients, and they have specific protocols that they run them through. So at Good Samaritan Hospital, and then up at the Wellness Pavilion in Mason. So if we go back here and you scroll down, I don't have a picture of it, but if you scroll down, it's gonna say EDS Pros Physical Therapy, and um, you're gonna select that, and then you wanna put in there what you're wanting evaluated. So like, is it a general EDS evaluation and treatment, or do you also want them to see the migraine specialist, because we do have a physical therapist up at the Wellness Pavilion that specializes in a protocol for migraines and is very helpful, but definitely put in there what you're sending them for, and then they will contact the patient and help get them set up. Just so you know, it's about a four to eight week wait because we send literally all of our patients to do that physical therapy, because like I said, that's the foundation. And just to kind of give a little bit more um, context to Last time I checked, we had about 486 hypermobile EDS patients at TriHealth, but that doesn't include hypermobility spectrum disorder or other forms of EDS. So, you know, as you guys have already seen, there's about 240 of you that were invited for this WebEx. You guys are seeing these patients as well. So it's very important that we recognize these patients, that we recognize their symptoms, that they're real, the, the pain and uh, disability that they're going through. And we, had, we really um, take that to heart and provide that specialized and personal care to them. So that is all that I have for today. And um, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Like I said, I can always be reached through email, Epic staff messaging, or Volt. And look forward to uh, many more talks in the future. Thanks. Bye.